This podcast was produced by Sean Weston Media. Welcome to episode 23 of the Media Will Eat Itself podcast, another season of interviews about how modern professional people work within modern media. In today's episode, Juliette Eccleston, the founder and CEO of Any Good, joins me to discuss her mission to change the recruitment industry. Juliet's professional background covers program and project management roles across a handful of industries, including the BBC, Legal and General, Britannia Building Society. It's her role as a director and company founder that I try to tap into during our conversation, particularly how she's adapted to changes in how businesses use modern media, the role of AI, for instance, and how she envisions the, the future of recruitment, particularly for young people getting their careers up and running. I hope you enjoy the show. So hi, Juliet. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So I, I actually found myself really engaged by a, a recent LinkedIn video you posted and, and you talked about the need to not only look after employees, but recover well ourselves as businesses. And, yes. and while your advice is, is quite pertinent right now, I, I was touched by your natural ability to convey that message. Okay. So <laughs> if you don't mind, for the benefit of those who haven't seen it, you were out walking your dog, getting some exercise. Yes. It seemed like the perfect filming environment. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, I think there's there's been an awful lot of um, conversations lately around um, people needing to be furloughed and redundancies, and um, and a lot of companies are very much focused on themselves and surviving um, yeah. uh, this process, and and it's incredibly difficult for an awful lot of businesses and individuals. Um, but what has really struck me is that. Um, in order for us to really recover well, uh, we need to think about not only our own businesses and our own employees, uh, but much more about the ecosystem that we're a part of. Um, and for me, in recruitment, that's very much not only thinking about my employees, but also how are my clients doing? And is there anything else I can do to help my clients to make sure that they still exist uh, when we start to come out of this? So yeah. if I can sort of spread that effort around my ecosystem, then um, as we start to emerge, uh, then the ecosystem that I'm a part of starts to recover well. And if, if that sort of starts to spread more broadly across different businesses, um, then, then that sort of effect that ripple effect of everybody supporting the economy uh, by supporting each other should be something that has a much bigger effect well it's the cobweb of business isn't it absolutely we all affect one another and it was such a common sense message but it was the way that you delivered it as well that i was i was particularly entranced by because we we see a lot of those businesses business messages going out behind the desk you know, someone may be suited and booted, perhaps not so much these days from home. Yes. But you were doing it on a walk as well. And yes. it felt the message you were saying is absolutely fantastic and, and such great expertise coming from an experienced professional like yourself. But you did it well on a walk. And it, there was almost... Um, there was almost an urgency to it. There was almost more potency to your message right. because <laughs> of the way you actually delivered it. And, and did you have that in mind, or was it was it a um, spur of the moment thing? Yeah, um, I've, I find it quite difficult actually doing videos. Um, I know that an awful lot of people do sort of regular uh, regular videos uh, very frequently on LinkedIn, and um, and I find it really hard unless I've got something I really want to say. Uh, I'm not somebody that that really finds it easy to just talk um, about not very much I, f I find that I find it quite easy once I've got something I'm quite passionate about especially if it's something that I haven't heard somebody else say before mm. um, and so if I've uh, if I've sort of got that a bit of a bee in my bonnet about something then I tend to want to just talk about it there and then um, and it was actually a run I'd been on so um, I was <laughs> I was uh, slightly concerned of the amount of views of um, of me after a run with my dog <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, but it was um, yeah one of those things where sometimes just um, speaking f you know from what from the heart after you've thought about something and mulled it over for a little bit about something that's pertinent rather than trying to do something every day um, you know that's much more generic and, and, and often has been said several times is is kind of more my approach really. 
really. Yes. Um, yes. Although I do keep being told I'm meant to do more videos, but um, yeah, I'm not. Oh, we all, I'm, not, yes, I'm not so we good all. at that. <laughs> <laughs> but at, at the same time, we, we are finding that you know we're going on these walks and these runs, and um, and it's thinking time. It's time yes. when we can actually say, well. Wow, look, you were on that run. Look at all those things that came in my head. I'm going yes. to do it now. This, and, and it was great. So, anyway, let, let's get some background on your career up till now. So, you're mm. CEO and founder of a company called Any Good, with That's a question right. mark. Uh, what kind of company is it and how does it work? Um, Any Good is a platform where professionals recommend other professionals for roles. Um, so clients will post a job on our platform, our members think about who they know and ask them if they'd like to be recommended and then they put them forward um, and clients then have the opportunity to rate the quality of each of those recommendations just like you would an Uber driver or an Airbnb host, although mm. I might need to stop using those as examples. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, but it it's works in a very sharing economy way um, and sort of takes away uh, the need for an intermediary in the middle of that process process and that sort of referral that's been happening for an awfully long time in terms of how people um, get into roles but there hasn't really been um, a platform that's enabled it to scale and that's what we're looking to do. Would I be old-fashioned in calling it uh, or, or saying it's like crowdsourcing for recruitment? Yeah, yeah. There's there's an awful lot of different definitions that can be used. Um, yep, definitely. Crowdsourcing is one. Um, and um, although we, the thing we don't do with um, in terms of the, some other platforms used with crowdsourcing is that we don't have it sort of on a voting basis. So it's not like the more people that recommend you, the better or anything like that. It's purely going out to the crowd um, and asking, do you know anyone who? Um, so they're then, actually more authentic referrals. Yeah, we didn't want yeah. it to be a popularity contest um, and we're very focused on it being an equitable platform so that um, we have a, a representation of society within the platform in terms of our membership so that we can ensure that these recommendations can come from many different types of groups, including those that are underrepresented ordinarily. Mm. And who are you appealing to? You mentioned Uber there, so the, there's a certain age group, I suppose, or a certain understanding of how the Uber model works. Is yes. that the sort of person you're appealing to to get on board with this? Yeah, I think a lot of certainly the clients that have uh, that we're working with um, are those that are very interested in new ways of doing things um, and not necessarily sort of pure technology plays. Uh, there's an awful lot of AI platforms out there that are, are, are matching candidates um, and roles, and that's not really where we are. Um, it's much more of a human-driven process, uh, and mm. so it's it's really those clients that are forward thinking that like new models. Um, so it's probably the clients that would have been um, sort of the early adopters of things like Airbnb and Uber and um, and all of the other different sharing economy type um, type platforms um, that we tend to to work well with, and also the members as well. Um, you know, there's a general feeling now in society that people recognise that the resources that they have can be used in different ways, whether it's a spare seat in a car or a spare room in a house or they have time to walk other people's dogs or, you know, all of these different types of things that people can do. And from our perspective, the professional network you have is a resource that you can use. Um, and so that's uh, that's sort of how we are, are like a lot of the other platforms and why we're often recognised by those people that use other platforms like that. Well, you were a freelance consultant for a, about roughly 16 years or so. Yes. Yeah, quite a while. So what inspired you to set up Any Good? Um, I think similar to an awful lot of other startups, it uh, it came from frustration, uh, which is a, a very good motivation. It's a common a, theme, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um, it is a, a very good motivation to start something because uh, you end up not being able to let it go until you've sorted it out. And yeah, I was uh, freelancing mainly in financial services, but also retail for a number of years um, as a programme manager. Um, and um, frequently when I moved from client to client, I would have to um, set up a new team and hire people and bring people in. Um, and what I found was that um, the best way to always find people was through recommendation. But there was no real way to do that at scale. Um, and an awful lot of the time I was having to work with certain agencies at certain clients because there was a preferred supplier list. 
Um, and, uh, and frequently the candidates that were, I was coming across just weren't right for the roles. They weren't bad candidates. They were just not right for the role that, um, that I was hoping to fill. And yeah. so um, I started to write down um, sort of if only somebody could deliver something different. And so I actually started to work on this model probably in about 2008, 2009, something like that, and started to draw out almost an instruction guide for somebody else to do this because uh, I needed it to do my job. <laughs> and yeah. um, and uh, it was like, if only somebody else could do this, then everything in my life would be really simple. Um, and so, and I kept on adding to that uh, over time in terms of sort of learning from the new players in the market and looking at how to help people um, transition their trust from old ways of doing things to new and, you know, how to um, engage members on a platform, how to drive the right kind of behavior behaviors um, so all of that kind of research was going on in the very early days of the sharing economy uh, when it was referred back in the day as uh, collaborative consumption and um, and so I did an awful lot of research then um, which then sort of drove into basically having a business model um, to then take forward uh, which initially I had no intention of, of doing but it was just more from a uh, somebody needs to do this um, mm. because this is a better way, I think, for the right candidates to get into the right roles and at a, a much lower cost. Well, you had done all the groundwork as well. so Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I had a conversation with a, an old colleague. Uh, I used to work at Egg back in the 90s and um, an old colleague from Egg. And uh, they were very... This, this is a mutual acquaintance, isn't it? Is this guy? Uh, no. Well, no. So I, we, yeah, the... I worked with yeah I worked with Guy Shane back in that was probably in yeah the late 90s okay. um and I was at Prudential back in 96 and so it was somebody somebody else actually that ah, uh, okay. that was there but yes I've worked with Guy more uh, both then and and more recently um and uh, so we had a conversation about um a, about this proposition and he said well why don't we do this together and um and we'll work on it and until that point really it had just been me and and a PowerPoint deck, and so um, so we kicked it off from there and um, and carried on researching and testing uh, for for quite a few years before it actually launched in 2017. So let's talk a little bit more about the recruitment industry itself and what it's like to work in these days, and how do you think it's changed over the years? Yeah, I mean, I, I in fact, this is I, I worked with Guy on um, on a piece of independent research that I wanted to have um, have him help me with, and so he um, and explain the market. I worked on some independent research um, because one of the things as I entered this brand new industry that I'd not been a part of. Um, was that I was concerned that my own um, biases towards sort of my own experiences might affect um, how I thought it was working and you know the, the, sort of the different ways that it worked compared to how perhaps others had experienced it. Mm. Um, so we commissioned some research and um, it was quite telling that um, my my experience wasn't unique. Um, in that less than five percent of people said that they trusted recruitment agencies to do a good job. Uh, for making sure they could find the the job that's right for you, um, and that's such a low, um, such a low it's percentage, very, very isn't, low, it? isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, if you were to look at other industries, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you, Juliet. I that's wonder right. if that is, is is there a do you think there's a perception from people who are uh, searching for their new career, their next their next move? Do you think there's a perception that that um, recruitment agencies all they're doing is going on LinkedIn? Very much, yes. That's certainly, um, and uh, and initially that would just be my own personal opinion, you know, when mm. I was originally doing this. But now, after having researched it so much, that's definitely the view that people have. Um, and so the, the the trust in the industry and the trust in individuals uh, is incredibly low um, mm. in terms of the amount of effort that they believe people are putting in. Um, and it's an incredibly hard job to be a recruitment agent, um, and it's incredibly competitive. There's an awful lot of data out there now you know it used to rely on people and their black books and their connections but everybody has access to pretty much the same information um, and so it's really hard um, really hard to do a good job and there are some great agencies out there um, but there are also an incredible uh, amount of ones that aren't really adding that much value uh, to the process and with a an activity and, an, uh, and a moment in somebody's life that's so important as changing jobs um, it really needs to have that focus of, of attention and, um, and importance. And that's also why I don't think 
pure technology um, is something that should be controlling the process. Yeah, you mean um, something like AI? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, apart from sort of all of the biases that uh, that can creep into AI, it's really, um, you know, although it's potentially could be considered an efficient process if it's purely technology driven, um, efficiency really is also about quality. Um, and f- certainly from the people that we spoke to, again, 90% of people said that they wanted recruitment to rely less on algorithms and more on humans. Mm. Um, and so there really does need to be this rethink about the industry. And maybe now is a great opportunity to do it, where uh, there needs to be a better combination of humans and technology making something that is much more efficient, both in a reducing friction perspective but also um, in terms of people connection perspective as well yes yes and i i I think in in the recruitment industry as in many industries technology has changed so much in the last uh, 10 years i mean just just a year just a few weeks and technology changes now it it changes the industry as well now do you think the recruitment uh, industry has kept up with the pace of technology change but also the behavior change in how we actually look for jobs um, no, I don't. I don't think it has. I've seen. Um, I think some of the technology will. So some of the technology is described as having AI, and it very much doesn't have AI. So there's some some descriptions of some of the platforms that are out there that um, that I think perhaps go beyond what the platforms are capable of. The thing that I think it hasn't done is kept up to date with different models, and it's the different models that I think are more interesting. Um, you know, sort of, you've got health tech and fintech and loads of different other industries that are coming out with different ways of doing things and they're turning things on their head and looking at it in a completely different way. Do you mean, do you mean different ways of finding talent? Uh, different ways of uh, of delivering their particular industry. Right, um, right. So if we go back to Airbnb, Airbnb in terms of travel and tourism has completely changed since they came uh, on the market and the mm. same as Uber with, with taxis and travel. Um, and there's an awful lot of other things that, that have changed, um, whether it's uh, car hire and now you can, you know, now everybody can rent out their own car uh, with companies like Hire Car. Um, and you can, you know, you can do so many more things now with, with the, just thinking of the, in, an industry in a different way. Yeah. And so what I've tended to see with recruitment is rather than thinking of it in a different way, it's been much more of a let's have the current process and let's use the current process and move that to something that's automated. Um, so they've automated an existing broken process rather than re-engineering the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and that's where I think a lot of the friction points still remain in that all, all we have in many cases is technology in the middle and, uh, and the candidate and the hiring manager at either end. Yeah. Um, and whether that's, and that's the same with AI, it sort of crept in. Um, and, you know, where we're at the point where we have video interviews happening where um, uh, it's uh, it's AI that's running in the background to identify whether that candidate is right for the job or not. Gosh, right. um, and the data that's fed into that AI is based on who are the really high top workers in, in a company and based on their mannerisms and the answers that they give and how they, how they answer things, that's then modelled and compared against the candidates. But for anybody that's from an underrepresented group um, or thinks differently or talks differently um, or has, um, you know, speech impediments or anything like that, um, it completely blocks all of that. And so I I really think we need to be going back to some really core, uh, what's what's some great design principles and designing for extremes rather than designing for the 80%. Often if we look at designing for the 20%, then it brings out much more interesting models and ways of doing things um, than if we just try and improve incrementally. Would very young people at the start of their career benefit from any good or is any good really appealing to to sort of the the people who've got experience under their belt already? 
Yeah, I would say at the moment um, it's uh, it's a platform that's popular with those that have got um, probably more than four or five years experience. Mm. Yeah. Um, but that's really just because of it based on a recommendation. It's good to um, have have several years of, of having worked with different colleagues and different people. Um, and so from a, a member perspective, um, it's useful for people to have been in the workplace for a little while. Um, saying that, we are also looking at graduate recruitment. Um, and again, it's one of those really tough um, processes where it's hard to tell the difference between one graduate and another because everybody can look very similar on a CV at that stage in their career. Um, and so what we're looking to do is to think about is there a way that we can bring recommendation in um, from either from the university that they've been working with or uh, or their own peers um, in order to help get have a better um, chance of finding the right people for the right roles. Yeah. Well, let's talk more about young people because you've been a mentor for something called Founders for Schools since probably January 2018, yes. I think I read. So this is an organisation that helps to connect business leaders with people in education with the aim of improving their employment opportunities. So, yeah. so how did you get involved with it, Julia? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that I, you know, when I was at school, I remember uh, actually all I ever wanted to do was be a policewoman. So that didn't quite yeah. work there. But I think it might have been because there was sort of this, uh, you know, it was very traditional in terms of the roles. And I just didn't know that there were, you know, the vast, vast um, roles that are out there. Um, and so when I saw this opportunity for people that uh, maybe hadn't had a traditional career to go and talk to um, pupils in schools of many different ages and share your experiences and, and often just to um, just to help them not be so fearful about the job market and that you don't need to know what you want to do for the rest of your life. Um, you know, I've, I've very much switched and changed, but always stayed curious and always been interested in what I'm doing and, and sort of trying to, to help, um, you know, a lot of the children that are maybe going through GCSEs start to, to realise that um, you don't have to know what you want to do and just do what you want to do now and then, um, and then sort of uh, follow your own path as you gather more experience and more interests. Um, but just stay curious and stay interested in what you're doing and you'll, you'll succeed and, and, you know, have a really good career. Um, and uh, it's been incredibly um, insightful, you know, in terms of the, the, what I get from it, it's incredibly um, useful to have conversations with people that aren't like you. Um, and that's really been something that I've been doing since, since you know, uh, launching Any Good. It's been incredibly important to not assume that you know everything and that you've got all angles covered. Um, and so I get so much from the conversations in terms of talking about recruitment with people. And they ask, you know, great questions about yeah. what it is. And you're like, oh, actually, that's a really good point. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, make some notes whilst we're having this conversation. As, as you've implied, it's a two-way learning experience, isn't it? It's how understanding how they view the world and then yes. how you can apply your experience experience to their view yes and I, I think also that's one of the things that has been interesting when you have a conversation with people um is that you know I, I talk about having founded any good and um and, and certainly from a, a female perspective it's not something that they think I'm there to talk about they think I'm there to talk about a different job that I might be doing rather than having founded a company mm -hmm. um and so it's great to be able to uh, to bash through some of those uh, assumptions that people might have about you as you as you enter a room and open up the possibility uh, for some of those um, some of those girls in schools um, to think about that's something that they could do too. Yeah, are you going to continue down the the road on, on mentorship? Yes, definitely. Is it something you get a lot of reward from? Yeah, 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 definitely. And I'm, I'm quite keen for us as an organisation to, to continue to have links with with others. Um, and uh, and I, I think that's where we'll continue on, um, potentially at a university, um, on the university side, as well as we move forward. Yeah. So what, what percentage would you say of young people do you actively encourage to start their own business? Um. I mean, I think... Such I an think open it, question. Sorry, it is, <laughs> isn't it? I think, and you know, I think as uh, I think within schools and colleges, I think it would be great for, for, for it to be part of the national curriculum almost in terms of 
um, those practical skills of um, how to do accounts, yes. how to launch a product, and and why not have an actual real product out there as as a, as a, a, a child at school or a, or a child at college, um, and really learn about. The, the things that you're going to have to do when you're out there and make education much more about uh, what you're going to experience as soon as you exit it, uh, rather than it being such a leap from uh, from being in a classroom environment to being in business. If yeah. you've already had to touch on marketing and um, you know social accounts and financials and and you've actually had to think about okay we've earned some money from this what, do we reinvest it or do we take some money ourselves and all of these kinds of things I think we've I, th- I think we've overcomplicated the education of, yes. of business or or made it the domain of a university something you do yes. later a business yeah. administration when I, I'm totally agree with you that there are a lot of things you can learn about business very early in your school life. Yes, I think we underestimate children considerably um, and they're capable of much more if they're allowed um, to to have that remit to to give something a go. I think they frequently surprise us Um, Mm. and I have a 13 year old and he frequently surprises me in in good ways as well as uh, as being a teenager. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, um, you know, and sometimes you forget just, you know, how... Um, how much activity their, their brain is is having at the moment, and just what they're capable of. Um, mm. And uh, and I think we could, you know, having partnerships with business perhaps for things like that is something that we would all benefit from, um, both at that particular point in time, but also as we move forwards and, and children then deciding whether that's something for them, um, rather than uh, sort of falling into a job and um, uh, and you know at least they would have much more experience um, hands on experience uh, of all aspects then yeah well my final question for you is how does any good play its part in a world changed perhaps long term by coronavirus yeah and i think um it's a good question <laughs> i think um i think we have to change the same as um an awful lot of other businesses and i think as an industry we need to change um as I mentioned earlier, what we're trying to do is to focus on our ecosystem. Um, and so we're extending our, our core proposition of recommendations out to be something where we can offer much more to our um, the employers that we work with, whether that's um, working them with them from a, a, in terms of helping their redundancies. So whether it's receiving members in because they've been made redundant, we're having mm. employers that are directly recommending their employees now for roles. Um, or whether it's recognising that companies aren't hiring now. So is there something else that we can be doing with those employers to help for the point at which they are? So we're doing things like helping uh, employers create talent pools um, so that the point at which they are hiring, um, they can move really fast because they've already gathered interest into particular roles that they know are going to be switched on at a point in time. So I think we really need to listen to... Um, the people that we're working with and um, I I hate to use that outside the box thinking or anything like that but we really need to not hold our core proposition so tightly um, allow them to flex much more than we are now and we'll be continuing to to talk and listen to the the employers that we're working with um, and really trying to think about exactly what is it they need from us what resources do we have um, that we can reuse and help them thrive so that then we can all thrive as part of the, that particular industry and, and as an, a broader economy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this discussion, Juliet. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and understanding uh, what the idea behind Any Good, how you got it started and, and so on. Uh, before you leave us, how do people get in touch with you to find out more? Um, so they can go to um, anygood.com uh, in terms of the website and also I have quite a unique name so easy to find me on LinkedIn Julia <laughs> Eccleston <laughs> Thank you so much That was Juliet Eccleston and you can find her online on LinkedIn and Twitter and the company website is anygood.com If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. But, you know, I think a share with a friend. Just let a friend know that you've listened to the podcast and you enjoyed it. And that would do me fine. Uh, Take a look at my own website at seanweston.co.uk for more information about me. In the meantime, stay tuned. There's more to come. Listener.